I don't know what's more intimidating, seeing that or having to follow not only Simon, but the President of the United States and then recent <laughs> Nobel Prize winner, and then some guy come up from bare feet to talk about jogging. Uh, um, so, no thanks at all to the TEDx people, but thank you very much to Simon's father, for whom I feel like my children someday, if they ever do go to college, will be thanking Simon's father for paying the tuition. Uh, you know, the, the theme of what we're here for today, it was about joy riding, you know, about the pleasure of movement, and that's not something that really is associated with running. If you talk to any runner for more than 30 seconds, I guarantee you'll talk about one of two things and probably both how fast they can go, and the last time they got injured. I mean, it just happened to me five minutes ago out in the lobby. I met someone, Carl, if you're still here, and within about three minutes, Carl, and you know it was you, what, what, what did you ask me, Carl? What, your 5K what was my fastest 5K time? <laughs> <laughs> it's guys, you know, chest out, how fast are you? <laughs> so neither one of these things is really associated with pleasure. How fast can you go and when did you get hurt, okay? How fast is work and, you know, and, and when you got hurt is pain and injury. Yet somehow we are supposed to believe that running is pleasurable, that there's some kind of joy attached to it. That's what people keep telling you, you'll feel good. Well, let me start off with a little parable, um, true life story about a guy named Barefoot Ted. If you've read Born to Run, then you know as much and probably more about Barefoot Ted than you ever want to know, and I'm referring specifically to the urine drinking incident. Um, if you haven't met Barefoot Ted, he is uh, almost indescribable. He uh, lives in Burbank, California, where he has a rickshaw which he uses to pull his wife and, daughters around wife and daughter around town. Um, as his name suggests, he runs barefoot. He um, is a, a pauper by choice, he says, because it makes life so much simpler. He has a 1968 Volkswagen Bug, which won't go more than 20 miles, which he feels is excellent. It removes so many temptations. Uh, Barefoot Ted's dream, his burning ambition in life, is to have a Victorian triathlon. For some reason, he wants to do an Ironman triathlon, but only using technology that existed in the 1890s which means he wants to swim two and a half miles in a wool swimsuit, ride 150 miles on a big wheel bike, and, and run a full marathon wearing these little leather slippers. Um, and it was, it was in, in quest of that Victorian triathlon that Barefoot Ted made the discovery which would change his life forever. He could actually master everything else. Swimming in the wool suit, no problem. The big wheel bicycle, no problem. But the simplest uh, challenge of all, just running 26 miles utterly baffled him because every time he tried to run, he got this excruciating pain in his lower back. And he bought more and more expensive shoes. He even bought a thing called the Kangoo Jumps, which had these like gigantic springs on them where you can literally jump over a car wearing these things. And he thought, perfect, I'll just bounce for 26 miles and, and be done. Except the Kangoo Jumps gave him even more excruciating pain than he had in normal running shoes. And so in frustration one day, he took him off and He's stalking back home pissed off because he paid $300 for these things. And in, in his rage and frustration, he gradually became aware of one thing. His back didn't hurt anymore. When he was barefoot, his back didn't hurt. So Barefoot Ted has become, and granted it's kind of a unique category, but he's probably become the world's greatest barefoot ultramarathoner. Barefoot Ted recently, a couple weeks ago, I saw him in Leadville, Colorado, where Barefoot Ted was running the Leadville Trail 100. That's a 100-mile foot race through the Rocky Mountains, uh, starting at 10,500 feet and going to 12,500 feet. So I met up with Barefoot Ted at mile 87. Now, this is a race where only one out of every two runners will even finish it every year. Um, and those who do usually finish in about somewhere between 29 and 30 hours. 30 hours is the cutoff. And most people, if they finish it all, barely make it in 30 hours. I met up with Barefoot Ted at mile 87. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning. At that point, he'd been running almost continuously for 24 hours. He'd started 4 o'clock the previous morning. He comes into the aid tent, and that's where people come and get some food and water. You look at this aid tent, it's like a mash unit. People are just sprawled out, exhausted. Barefoot Ted comes through the door, and you knew it was Barefoot Ted because he came through the door talking and never stopped. Yapping, talking, shaking hands sees me and he's like, okay, I'm not running anymore. I said, Ted, you got 13 miles to the finish line. Oh, I'll get there. You and I have to catch up and get together again. We haven't talked in a long time. For the next 13 miles, for the next three hours through the woods, Ted talked nonstop. 
And as he's talking, we're passing people. We're going faster than the guys who are running their asses off you know, while Ted's just chatting away. And at one point, he passes a guy that he knew, and he said, hey, Bob, I've taken this race, and I've turned it into a chat fest. And, and this guy, Bob, goes, I'm not surprised. <laughs> but Ted beat Bob. Ted beat a lot of people. Ted finished this thing in 27 hours, three hours ahead of the cutoff. And there's a picture of us at the finish line, and Ted's got this huge beaming smile on his face. Had a blast. Everybody else is sprawled out, exhausted, and Ted looks like it was a big surprise party thrown exclusively for him. <laughs> so what happened with Ted? One thing about Ted, too, is that he only trains 25 miles a week. Anybody who runs a marathon is going to do more in one day than Ted does in a week. He runs four or five miles a day, four or five times a week, and yet somehow he takes those paltry miles and he converts it into a very fast 100 miles of rugged terrain and beats most of the people there. How does he do it? I submit to you what Ted has come up with is something that the rest of us have forgotten, unfortunately, in our approach to athletics. Ted is not interested in the limits of what's possible. Ted is interested in the limits of what's pleasurable. You know, Ted remembers that running was our first fine art. You know, long before we did anything else, and long before we thought we were like masters of the universe with our science and our technology and our digital stuff, the only thing we could do was run. Running is what we had as our art before we had science, art, imagination, literature, technology. All we could do was move this thing, and then move this thing, and then move, and then move this thing. But because we were such excellent runners, everything else followed. Everything else became um, those great sciences and technologies that we rely on today. And one way you can sort of get a sense of this is when you look back throughout history, there have been three running booms in the past 100 years. And each one of those running booms has corresponded to some national crisis. Every time people suddenly get very excited about running, it's usually because something really awful happened about the year before. First running boom was in the 1920s during the Great Depression. Next big running boom, a lot of you probably remember, because a lot of you who run today probably started during that boom, was in the 1970s, probably one of the darkest times in our national history. The third running boom was one year after September 11th. By the year 2000-2001, the single fastest growing outdoor recreational sport was trail running and ultra running. So where does this come from? Why is there this correlation between distance running and national calamities? Well, you know, one theory could be that the reason why we run is because that's what we do when we're afraid, right? When you're scared, you haul ass, you take off. Every little kid knows this. But there could be something else as well. Maybe the reason why we run is the same reason we, we build things like this. Theaters, places for entertainment, places for fun. Because for too much of our existence, we've correlated running with fear and pain and injury. But there's something else there, something much more powerful, and that's the, the motivation and the energy of pleasure and of fun. And we think about this too. You know, where running goes is where we go. You know, throughout our history, running is the one thing we could rely on. You know, before you had sex as pleasure, you had running. If your ancestors weren't great runners, none of you would ever be having sex because you wouldn't be here. You know? <laughs> you know, two million years ago, when Homo erectus you know, first emerged upon the planet, we didn't have fangs, we didn't have claws, we didn't have strength, we didn't have speed. You know, as you all know, Usain Bolt is the fastest human in history. Usain Bolt can get his ass kicked by a squirrel. You, know? you can turn a squirrel loose at the Olympic Games. Whoever can catch that squirrel deserves a gold medal. So we had no natural advantages in the wild, except for one thing. Humans are really good at sweating. We can vent heat, we can perspire better than any other land-based uh, land mammal in history. And what we did two million years ago was we took this ability to sweat, and we combined it with all this connective tissue, all this uh, the, the springy fascia in our body, and we combined these things into this ability to just coast across the African savanna really quickly and really effortlessly. And what we did was we took this ability and used it to run other animals to death. In some ways, it's almost diabolical. You know, it's just all we did was we would just scare up a bunch of antelope and went out as a hunting pack and just ran after them until we were venting our heat by uh, perspiration. They could only vent their heat by respiration. So after four or five miles, we're still cool and comfortable. They have a choice. They can either breathe or they can cool off, but they can't do both. Over falls the antelope. The only problem, though, is it leaves us today with this dilemma. If this is our natural ability, if this is our, our natural heritage, it's our greatest natural ability, then 
why does it suck, you know? <laughs> why do we have aches and pains and get hurt? Why is it that 90% of all marathoners are injured every single year? Why is it that somewhere between 50 to 80% of all other uh, runners are injured every single year? There's a clash there, you know? Um, I'm sure 90% of all Blue Jays aren't hurt by uh, flying every year, you know? <laughs> 58% of all trout don't suffer, you know, rotator cuff ailments. <laughs> they take their natural abilities and they thrive, and that's what they want to do. You know, you take a dolphin out of the water, that dolphin doesn't feel good. You put the dolphin back into the water, it suddenly it's very happy again. Yet somehow, if we're supposed to be good runners, yet somehow we always break down, we get hurt, we don't like it, we complain about it, we don't want to do it. I think what has happened is basically this, is like all things that we are best at, someone figures out, well, if we're so good at this, and it's so much fun, there's got to be a way to yank the cash register and make money off of it. And I think, unfortunately, what we've seen over the past 30 or 40 years is we've taken the thing that is most natural to us, the greatest to us, and we have gotten back to, away from that, that motivation of, of fun, and converted to the other, the dark side of the yin and yang, which is the motivation of fear. We've made ourselves afraid of our bodies. We're afraid of getting hurt, of getting injured, of doing too much, of doing too little, of not doing it right, not having the right kind of a body, not having the right kind of a shoe, not having the right kind of a training program. We've been fed all of these fears, which always are a perfect um, economic device because all of us have a sense of inferiority. And if you tell somebody, if you don't do this, you'll get hurt or you'll be bad at it, then you, do, you know, automatically do this. You reach for your wallet. I will pay money not to be afraid. And that's what's happened with running. We've taken this activity, which every five-year-old somehow figures out how to do. You know, you don't see five-year-olds going to Bikram yoga before they can go out for a run. <laughs> five-year-olds don't taper. You know, five-year-olds don't cross-train. You know, five-year-olds don't buy shoes. Five-year-olds don't even want to wear shoes. What does a five-year-old do? You say, come here, and what does, off they go. They run. They real, what they realize is that you know, running throughout history has always been associated with freedom, vitality, with kind of earthbound flight. It's the way we can take gravity, which we usually struggle against. It's the one time we can take gravity, which is this oppressive weight, and turn it into something to our advantage. Because all running is this, falling. It's just falling forward. And at some point, you gotta catch yourself with a foot and then you just keep falling forward. When you run your best, it should feel like nothing. This is something that Geronimo knew, because um, back when Geronimo was being chased by the cavalry, in a moment of crisis, he had a choice. He got to stay on his horse or take off. And every single time, Geronimo got off his horse, let it go, and he ran. Because he used to say that the only thing I trust are my two legs. My legs are my only friends. Geronimo and Native Americans and many other cultures realized that the most effective way to escape anything, um, to, to move, and to also have that sense of vitality was to rely on that, that, that Native heritage, that ancestral birthright of running. When you look back at the ancient Egyptians, for instance, the ancient Egyptian kings, the only way they maintained their hold on the throne was by running a long distance course every year. And many of the ancient Egyptian kings would do this until in, late into their 90s. So all this is great, okay? I, that thing, I think made a pretty persuasive case for why we should all get out here in the light right now and go for a run. A except we're left with one problem. How do you actually do it? How do you do it in a way that doesn't hurt? And that was the dilemma I was facing because Back in 2000, I was a broken down ex-runner, about 40 pounds heavier than I am now. And logically, I decided this is not a pursuit I ever wanted to do it again, because every time I did it, I got hurt. But then I hear about this tribe in Mexico, the Tarahumara, who are running 150, 200 miles at a time. They take the distance we were told actually killed Philippides 26 miles, and they multiply it by 10, and they're doing it when they're 70 and 80 years old. And what I wanted to know was, what are these guys doing that the rest of us aren't? And there are basically two answers. N number one, what they're not doing is suffering heart disease or high cholesterol or clinical depression or um, domestic abuse. They're not having heart attacks. They're not having diabetes. They're not fighting wars. Um, they're not uh, committing suicide. And they're not committing crimes against each other. Basically, you take any category for which you would win a Nobel Prize for the rest of your life if you solved even one of these things, and the Tarahumara have solved all of them without even looking back. That's the one thing they're doing. The second thing they're doing is they're not relying on the armature and the weaponry of fear in order to do this activity. They strip running back to first principles. And first principles are bare feet and a sense of relaxation and pleasure. Exactly what a five-year-old does. And I don't mean to infantilize the Tarahumara, 
But essentially what they've done is stripped away all of the stuff associated with fear and focus on the stuff associated with fun. It's a pretty profound lesson because not only has it worked astonishingly well, well for the Tadu Mata, because not only can they run these fantastic different distances, but they've also realized that you know, when you take an animal or an organism away from its natural habitat and its natural customs, what usually happens to that organism is it begins to rot from the inside out. If you go to the zoo right now and look at the pandas or the Siberian tigers, you'll realize they have trouble reproducing and trouble eating and they have mood swings and aggression issues and essentially, you know, modern humans. You take them out of their natural circumstances and you start having obesity and, and reproductive and sexual issues. What the Tatamata realized then is you get back to that natural function and a lot of things very quickly and easily start to flow along as well. So the question which remains to us is, okay, so where's the bridge? Where's the bridge from where we are today, a culture that is suffering from something like a 30 or 40% obesity rate, and you get back to where the Tarumata are? The difficulty is that where the Tarumata are is at the bottom of a canyon in caves eating barbecued mice, okay? <laughs> Obviously an option which I've not chosen for myself. But where I think we can find a transferable skill is looking back at what Barefoot Ted discovered what the Tarumata have known for tens of thousands of years, and which uh, a sort of a growing underground movement of, of barefoot and other minimalist runners are starting to discover every day, which is rather than practicing fear, practice fun. When you go out there for a run or any kind of activity, you can either focus on how much it's going to hurt, how difficult it's going to be, or how much you want to get. Uh, and at some point, you'll probably quit or be frustrated. Or you can just focus on practicing fun. And that's where I think barefoot Ted and I have to say, I met, I met Barefoot Ted in 2006, it's now 2010, it's been taking me four years to sort of cut through the goofiness that is Ted, to actually see the intelligence at, at the core of that personality. He told me this back in 2006, and I didn't quite get it, but he said, every time you make a movement, you are practicing one thing or the other. You're either practicing something that's fun, or you practice something that you want to be over with. And he always focuses on rehearsing fun, getting that into his muscle memory. It's something that I also heard from a guy named Caballo Blanco. This is somebody who made his way down to the Copper Canyons long before I did, in search of that same kind of bridge between where we are today and where the Tarumata have always been. What was so eerie about Caballo Blanco, the white horse, is that when he first went down to the canyons, he was the same age I was. He was also a broken down ex-runner. He's my same height and same shoe size, so it's this kind of weird doppelganger kind of thing when I met him. And he and I tried to go for a run together. I couldn't stay with him at all. And he stopped for a second, turned around, looked me in the face, he goes, you know what's wrong with you people? And by you people, he meant all of us who actually don't live in a hut at the bottom of a canyon like him. <laughs> what's wrong with you people is it's always about getting fast. You always want to get to the finish line. You always think about getting to the finish line and then working your way back, you know, backwards toward the starting line. You got it backwards. You got to start with easy. You guys think you'll get fast first and after a while being fast, and then it'll get easy. You got to focus on easy first because if that's all you get, that ain't so and once you get easy, then eventually, by enjoying it, you'll get better and better and better until you get to fast. But by the time you get to fast, you won't care anymore. So I know I'm throwing a lot of kind of bizarre patchwork ideas at you, but I hope to leave you that one thought. If you focus on easy and that's all you get, that ain't so bad. Thanks very much.